Hello friends, welcome to EPG Pachala. I am Dr. Anurekha Chari Vag, Assistant Professor, Department of Sociology, Savitri Bhai Phule, Pune University. Today we are going to discuss the module titled Green Revolution, Implications for Agrarian Structure 1. This module is part of the paper titled Agrarian Social Structure and Change. This paper has been coordinated by Dr. Manish Thakur, IIM, Kolkata. In this module, as you can see from the title, refers to the Green Revolution and what kind of implication it has on the agrarian structure. Further, in trying to understand the impact on the agrarian structure, it is going to look into four important areas. First, the whole idea of pluritarianization. Second, the whole idea of embourgeoisie meant. Third, whether the whole impact of green revolution has led to the growth of new classes and finally, how and when green revolution has led to popularization of large groups of rural poor in India. The decade of the 1950s and the 1960s, India undertook several measures to improve the condition of its cultivating classes who constituted a vast majority of India's population at the time of its independence. The peasants and the workers had participated in a large numbers in movements like non-cooperation movement and civil disobedience movement which ultimately led to India's independence. They had suffered repression hoping that political freedom from the yoke of the British would lead to an improvement of their own situation in the, in the form of freedom from oppressive zamindari system which characterized large parts of rural India. Radical land reforms consisting of tenancy reforms, imposition of land ceilings, abolition of intermediaries were envisaged as tools that would lead to a redistribution of land among the landless and alleviate poverty in the long run. Now the progress of land reforms was not as envisaged, there was a common consensus and recognition among the people about the interventionist role of the state which thought that it had a direct responsibility towards its citizens, particularly the rural impoverished masses who had very low bargaining power in a market of unequal exchange. Even before the land reforms were properly underway, India faced a serious food crisis in the early 1960s, especially in the eastern region. The roots of this food crisis could be traced back to the colonial powers which had not done much to improve the food production systems in the colonized nations during their reign. In fact, the British not only tampered with the existing uh, community-based systems of land tenure by creating vested interest in land, they also practiced an extractive system which eventually led to the impoverishment of the land and the people who worked on it. To add to it, the population of these less developed, newly independent nations like India grew at a historically high rate. A series of back-to-back -back droughts in parts of India made the precarious situation even worse. By the mid-1960s, hunger and malnutrition became widespread in the developing countries of Asia. Countries like India increasingly became dependent on food aid from rich countries during this time. PL480 or the Food for Peace program was one such program whereby the Indian government was provided humanitarian aid in the form of concessional grant to import wheat from United States to tide over its food crisis. Although named food for peace, this was also a foreign policy instrument whereby the condition was that India would adopt technology developed in the United States with the support of Rockefeller and Ford Foundation for its agricultural modernization. India was also expected to temper its criticism of the United States over the issue of Vietnam War. PL480 program garnered a lot of criticism in the country. In order to shake off the humiliating shackles of US public law, 480, the entire efforts of the Indian state shifted towards enhancing food gain production and achieve self-sufficiency in this field during the late 1960s. The first round of land reforms has led to abolition of intermediaries but it did not result in significant land distribution. In fact, a widespread rural unrest was brewing up in different parts of the country which would have to be tackled by the state eventually. This was in the context in which Green Revolution and its program of agricultural modernization were introduced in India. Green Revolution well, irrigation and left irrigation, use of high fertilizer doses and pesticides and other institutionalized measures for translating the ideology of Green Revolution into practice. In other words, the Green Revolution as a program as an ideology is defined as a large scale application of modern science and technology to agriculture. In the coming years, this US sponsored technological package framed the broad ideology of rural transformation in India. 
In the first two decades after independence, the measures of rural development in the form of community development program, land reforms and cooperative institutions had not resulted in either elevating rural poverty and inequality or increasing agricultural productivity substantially. Hence, an increase in farm production was expected to be a lasting solution to the problems of rural poverty and hunger, a measure that would improve the quality of life in rural areas. The Green Revolution technology was at the region Punjab, Haryana, Western, Uttar Pradesh and parts of Bengal from 1967 to 73. New varieties were also needed to be resistant to pests and diseases apart from retaining the desirable cooking and consumption traits. These strains were developed in different parts of the world. For example, borrowing from rice breeding work in China, Japan and Taiwan, the International Rice Research in Manila, Philippines developed semita varieties which met most of these conditions. Impact of the Green Revolution in increasing yields and bringing about concomitant changes in rural society continued for a few decades till the mid-1980s. As reiterated in an earlier model, the achievements of the Green Revolution were manifold. It included an increase in the employment opportunities of the rural poor and in the non-farm sectors, a moderate and selective rise in agricultural wages, modernization of agriculture, benefits securing to farmers on account of introduction of a new technology and increase in agricultural surplus and opportunities of investment, better nutritional opportunities offered due to a rise in income and a reduction in food prices leading to a more diversified diet. But despite the initial achievements, several constraints and disturbing trends have continued to surface, affecting the projected growth of the agricultural sector. Some of the negative outcomes of the Green Revolution had been the creation of a new regional disparities as a result of the selective spread of new agricultural technology and increase in the divide between the small and the big farmer, effect of mechanization in the displacement of labor, and the skewed terms of trade between agriculture and industry. But along with the above, one of the persistent and far-reaching impact of Green Revolution has been on the ecology of the regions in which it was introduced. Green Revolution has been termed as an ecological misadventure as it has caused deterioration of soil quality, depletion of groundwater resources, poisoning from fertilizer, pesticides and loss of gen genetic biodiversity. Here in this module, we are concerned with the significant impact of green revolution technology on the agrarian structure in different parts of the country. This will be elaborated with examples being drawn from particular regions. Before we go into the transformation that green revolution has brought about, it would be wise to look into the agrarian structure that existed in the period before technology was adopted agrarian structure before green revolution. Adoption and success of green revolution technology in India were shaped by the historical property relations that existed in India since independence. These relations varied across the country to some extent they came into being even before the British began the colonial rule in India. British did not do much to change these systems which created social classes in different states. The existence of these classes as well as the economic relationship between farmers and government has played a major role in how agricultural development has taken place. Under the Zamindari system of land tenure, few owned the land. They were responsible for revenue collection on behalf of the British and therefore had a free reign when it came to imposition and collection of taxes in the regions under the jurisdiction. Those who were unable to pay taxes had their lands taken away by the Zamindar giving rise to social disparity. Um, whereby some had access to land and others did not. In the Rightwari system, the British collected the land revenue from the owner cultivator or riots depending upon the average annual output. As part of the Mahalwari system, it was a group of cultivators who owned the land, who owned the village, were collectively responsible for the payment of taxes. Often in the Mahalwari system, because of the collectivity consisted of a very few or sometimes even one landowner who owned the land in the entire village, it resembled the Zamindari system in many ways. But the tax rates were variable here too. It depended on the rent paid by various classes of tenants, on the nature of soil type, on their caste status and the capacity to afford irrigation as well as the basic abilities to successfully cultivate the land. The Green Revolution technology was more suitable for areas in which conditions of capitalist farming existed. It is said that those areas which were historically under Zamindari tenure received less of the Green Revolution technology as economic and political power was concentrated in the hands of few landlords. Wealth distribution among peasantry is important because it determines how many farmers can really make risky investment in those of Green Revolution. 
technological advancement dependent upon the incentives of farmer to participate that is those who cultivate their own lands are more likely to make large investments in technology whereas those working on the other's land do not have the incentive to do so thus distribution of wealth and success of farmers across different states were affected by how land taxes were collected hundreds of years ago implications of green revolution for the agrarian structure green revolution brought about complex multidimensional changes in an indian agriculture whose impact is being felt even now while some of the positive and negative socio economic ecological impact had been touched upon in the earlier two modules the emphasis here is predominantly upon the impact of green revolution on the agrarian social structure what will be highlighted are the ways in which green revolution has led to the widening gap between small and big farmers increasing proletarization of cultivators despite increasing agricultural its nutritional impact on the changing production relations on the poor the growth of new class of the gentleman farmers interested in accumulating land for purposes of speculation other than cultivation and despite rise in the wages also crop fields the cost of degree of embourgeoisment of certain sections have been rather too high one of the impacts of green revolution has been witnessed in the rural countryside is the process of proletarianization owing to the growing capitalist penetration in the countryside the process of depeasantization has been accelerated and consequently large number of small farmers and poor peasants have been pushed into the ranks of landless laborers this proletarianization process has been found to be more striking in the green revolution area in view of this process of proletarianization the improvement that the green revolution is expected to bring about in the conditions of wage laborers appears to be a distant mirage at least the position of the rural poor particularly the agricultural labor so as a class is not likely to be altered substantially vis-a-vis the rich farmers who virtually monopolize economic resources and control credit institutions in the countryside by raising the productivity of land the green revolution did not make it possible for farmers to grow two to three crops a year on a piece of land and thus enable rural workers to gain employment throughout the year as a whole This resulted in the rise in the demand for agricultural labor. Billings and Singh estimate that the, the total number of mandates of the work of the agricultural labor went up from a total of 50 mandates to 60 mandates with the introduction of new technology for irrigating farmland. However, when palm sets, wheat threshers, corn shellers and tractors were introduced, average demand for labor dropped down to 25.6 mandates. Now in parts of Haryana green revolution changed the paternalistic relations between agricultural laborers and big farmers re- replacing it with more contractual relations there were reports that in most parts of the country attached laborers were thrown out of work or were reduced to casual day laborers Although mechanization of farm opportunities brightens the scope of employment opportunities and wages in the green revolution areas migration of farm laborers from Bihar eastern UP Rajasthan has affected the conditions of bargaining for a higher wage A review of the impact of the London-based Halsemeyer Declaration Group report cited by Dhanagra admitted that in Punjab and Haryana the trickle-down effect of green revolution was partially visible in improved daily wages of agricultural laborers which is estimated to have increased by 89% from 1961 to 1968 however the so-called gains were totally offset by the rise in prices which was believed to be about 93% in the specified period in spite of substantial increase in the agricultural production The process of proletarianization also had an impact on the patterns of consumption among farmers. It is found to be unequal as Bhalla and Chadda study revealed. One third of the marginal farmers, one fourth of the small farmers and one fifth of the medium level farmers from the sample were living below poverty line and were on starvation diets. In a total sample of 1663 household studies about 16.48% farming households were living below the poverty line. The proportion was positively correlated to the farm size in all the three regions of Punjab if 16% households of the landless laborers were added to added then the proportion of the rural households living below poverty line jumped up to 32% this was distressing considering the fact that Punjab is the most developed state in India embourgeoisment as reiterated earlier the green revolution had differential impact among people of different caste and class while some groups commute communities and classes benefited due to the socio economic position in society a combination of factors along with green revolution led to a process of embourgeoisment experienced by a section of lower caste and classes in green revolution areas that did not mm, as far as uh, that did well as far as agricultural productivity was concerned there was a demand for labor due to manifold one form of farm employment This has led to a rise in agricultural wage rates which benefited agricultural laborers. This has led to a rise in agricultural wage rates 
which benefited agricultural laborers to some extent. Further, the Green Revolution was undertaken for implementation at a time when the first phase of land reform was partially underway in some parts of the country. As mentioned earlier, this technological initiative could only be successfully undertaken in areas where production relations were enabling. Following the enactment of land sealing laws in some parts of the country, namely Western UP, it was found that small parcels of land had been acquired by the poorer members of society through purchase through government schemes which allocated land to the poorest and the most disadvantaged and through a combination of these. Whether these small landholders were benefit from land ownership is debatable, but in a country where agriculture was the mainstay of society, access to land was considered to be important for security and survival. In Bulan Shahar, for example, studied 35 years later by Barker and Chivit, it was found that Green Revolution predictions that the rich would get richer by buying up land from the poor did not happen in Uttar Pradesh. This has largely been due to the 18-acre land ceiling established in the state since 1996. Farmers with more than 18 acres were obliged to surrender any excess land. A few farmers in the village studied lost their land through this scheme. Land which had been surrendered together with all land designated as pair in the villages were distributed to the Sharu caste and disadvantaged people in keeping with the Indian constitution's commitment to social and economic justice. As a result, the numbers of different caste and groups who own land increased. Most of these beneficiaries of land distribution were among the poorest Hindus and Muslims. In 1972, when the villagers were first studied, uh, power lay in the hands of the Brahmins and Rajput. With higher caste Hindu farmers and in some villages with wealthier Muslims, these powerful farmers who also had the largest land holdings, uh, Barker and Jivich Fieldwork revealed that over the past 30 years, many of the dominant Hindus particularly the Rajputs and the Jats had sold off the land after profiting from Green Revolution and moved to Bulan Shahar or other urban areas in search of salaried employment. Because of the land ceiling in the study villages from a Rajput and land had been acquired by Muslims and by the lower Sharul caste such as Jatavas, ba Balmiki or Chamas who are now numerically dominant among Hindu farmers in Sabdalpur, Chirchita and Kurwal Banaras. Dao the position of land by itself did not significantly improve their life situation. Most of them thought that the growth of Bulan Shahar as a town and the prosperity brought in due to Green Revolution and the distribution of land under the Ambedkar scheme in Mayavati reg Mayavati's regime have played a part in improving the quality of life. The researchers found that the SEs are apparently better off than they were. The poorest among them, the Balmiki, claim to have enough not to be hungry. Now their material assets are still meager in comparison with those of the higher caste neighbors. The landers also claim to have benefited from the Green Revolution. The growth of Bulan Jahar has stimulated non farm economy and has seen a rise in the demand for labor. As a consequence, employment opportunities for both men and women had increased as had the wage rate. Despite these positive changes, many of the poorest caste and classes still live in poverty. But it was asserted that no one, bed to, no one went to uh, bed hungry anymore. Emergence of new classes, evictions and popularization of tenants. The Green Revolution transformed the rural landscape in irrevocably. Because of the initial success in production and the regions in which it was produced, land values increased considerably over time. Now it was not the matter of real estate position, farmers thought of land as an asset for the future and were not averse to amassing it. Prices were being doubled within a short span of time and farmland close to highways fetched high prices. Any owner of productive land, irrespective of its location, always stood to gain if he were to sell even a part of his land. Profitability in farming was bringing about a change in the attitude of well-off farmers who were interested in investing more land than tax-free income could buy. Evidence from Punjab. Wolf Lajinsky, a World Bank consultant on agrarian reforms, told Punjab as it was experiencing green revolution. He found that land had, land had acquired a speculative image because of the appearance of gentlemen farmers. The buyers are, are a motley group, some connected with land through family types, some altogether new to agriculture. A few have unemployed rupees acquired through undeclared earnings, and most of them look upon farming as a tax haven, which is which it is and a source of earning tax-free supplementary income. 
in most cases the purchases ranges from 10 to 20 acres in the circumstances land prices are of no crucial importance to them they are looked upon as unfair competitors in a limited land market and there is no love loss between would be farmers and genuine farmers the latter predicting that the former will come former will come to grief meanwhile land value had continued to rise with little thought of whether productivity and prices are still with them Another problem with the emergence of new classes and the rise of land prices during that period in Punjab was that no one wanted to lease out land to tenants anymore. Punjab, according to an estimate, had 5,83,000 tenants in the late 60s. The traditional crop sharing patterns were such that a tenant had to give 50% of the crops produced to the land owner as part of rent. But Punjab Security of Land Tenures Act of 1953 provided for a maximum rental not exceeding one third of the crop. This provision was also bypassed just like other provisions such as security of tenure. The result was large scale eviction of uh, tenants on the ground of resumption of land for self cultivation. According to an estimate provided by Punjab government in 1964, the number of tenants who are still holding lands after the commencement of the act is 80,250. The vast difference is largely due to out and out ejectments, voluntary land transfers or transfer of tenants to the status of sharecroppers or agricultural laborers. The new technology in Punjab demonstrated the profitability of farming with green revolution technology. Coupled with high land values and absence of any effective restrictive rent measures, upward revision of rents were inevitable. Rents move from 50 to 50 to 70 to 30 percent of the crop in favor of the owner, making it difficult for tenants to sustain themselves. In order to sustain productivity, the package of input seeds, fertilizers, waters, pesticides had to be used. But the rising cost prevented the tenants from using the inputs as prescribed. Only owner cultivators with sizable land holdings who also lease land are in a position to do just that. For the tenant sharing of crop on a 70-30 basis was not a boon, now they thought that raising rents as a Consequence of raising land values was inevitable. It was hardship for those who could not extract the land from a large return enough to meet the requirements over and above the rental obligation and inputs which they must be largely their own. Tenants are also at the receiving end when the owners farmers fear that they may claim occupancy rights over the land. This experience together not only led to the pauperization was probably the beginning of economic stresses and strains of the poor peasant household which assume serious proportions in a prosperous state like Punjab. Students, in conclusion to the module Green Revolution and the implications on the social structure, especially in terms of the agrarian social structure, we could see how Green Revolution transformed the social relations within rural India. Further, because of the Green Revolution, there widened the gap between small and large farmers. Further. What has happened is because of the impact of green revolution, the profit for landed farmers has increased thereby leading to greater pauperization and greater vulnerability and marginalization of the rural poor within rural India. Thank you.